Good morning and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, our flagship TV and radio stations. In addition today, as always, we're joined also on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 by Birmingham Area Municipal Access and in uh, Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and Franklin as well. Also on the radio uh, on 88.1 WB. FH, the Biff out of Bloomfield Hills and online on Facebook via Facebook Live with our friends over at the Orchard Mall and we thank the Orchard Mall for joining us on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast as you can see on your screen on the TV side facebook.com slash Orchard Mall uh, go ahead and give them a like and join us today on Facebook if you are unable to on television and you're coming home or going into the office and want to tune in to the Oakland County Megacast as we go through today's top stories and talk to a bunch of interesting guests on the show as well. Packed Friday edition of the program today, Ronnie. I know, but we've had a very busy week, Tyler. I yep. feel like I've already worked uh, a full week <laughs> before I. coming in. Uh -huh. uh, I will say um, on my way in, because I don't live far away, I uh, stopped by the vaccination clinic yes. at uh, the West Bloomfield Fire Station. Uh, dropped off something for uh, Chief Flynn and uh, also had the uh, chance to see some of my old police department friends from West Bloomfield from back in my reporting days. So it was great to catch up with them. And I will say, they are doing such a great job over there. That line was moving like that. And uh, plus the good thing about it is people get to stay in their cars so they don't have to expose themselves to other people because we are in the middle of a pandemic. We're telling people not to be near other people, yet some of these sites require you to go in, stand in line, and, um, it, you know, it's a kind of a chaotic scene, but that was not the case over there. So I got to witness it myself, and we'll have Chief Flynn on a little bit later today as well. Yeah, it was interesting the last time we had him on. He explained some of the rationale behind why they are holding these uh, drive through clinics for COVID-19 vaccinations. And one of the reasons is because of that, con is because of, of course, the convenience, but also because of the distancing that it provides you. You can stay in your car. You're not, if you're standing, you're not standing in line, you're at least six feet apart and you're inside a completely different vehicle. So there is that buffer zone. You're able to move people through much more efficiently and an added benefit, and we've especially seen that over the course of this week, is that with inclement weather, when it's snowing outside or it's extremely cold as it has been multiple times throughout this past week, uh, it allows people to stay in the warmth of their cars, roll their windows down when it's time to get their shot, and then be on their merry way without having to be in the elements or exposed to COVID-19 by being in such close proximity to other people. I did feel bad for some of the workers and volunteers oh, yeah. because they were the ones standing out in the elements. Uh, the wind not quite as biting out there today, but I will say, Tyler, looking at the images coming out of Texas and you feel for the people and what they're going through when your pipe burst in your home, um, I, I know you live in an apartment, so you probably have never gone through this. Um, we've gone through it a couple times now. And uh, one time was just, you know, uh, regular plumbing issues. But the uh, first time was because of a really, really cold snap that we had a couple years. And it was a pipe inside of our home in the basement. And it was just like a flood of water. And for some of these people to try to get help during this time because the need is so great. Uh, they played on the news yesterday, the 911 calls from so many of these people and so many of these families. Your heart breaks from them when you're seeing icicles hang from their ceiling fans and there's no place to go. Uh, but then another example of our politicians not being in touch with what we're going through 
Cruz, what were you thinking? Yeah, what, what a boneheaded move. I mean, e even if you are legitimately just getting your kids out of the situation and coming right back, what a bo boneheaded move. There's other ways to do that. Um, you you do have a fa you do have family in Texas that could, you could have sent with, with your kids out of the state during that time. Uh, it could have just been your wife. It could have just been other family that you have in Texas with you. You are a leader of that state. You are elected as a leader from that state on the federal level during a an extremely tough crisis in that state where they're experiencing unmeasurable cold temperatures and weather and inclement weather that they have not regularly experienced down in Texas and it's having a major effect because of their proximity on the power grid being an individual power grid and you're skipping the country for a couple of days to you know, soak Look, up the sun in Cancun. You're he not going was there. not going for a couple of days. No, you see he that totally baggage. Did you see the baggage he had with him in the airport? Yes. That's not. That's not a. Oh, I'm just going to drop him off overnight and come back. What, what, what are, you, what are you bringing your entire closet there just in case your flight gets delayed? G give me a break. So um, I really kind of enjoy watching from the sidelines uh, the PR aspect of how yeah. some of these situations play out. And in the beginning, of course, we're talking about Ted Cruz, the elected representative or the senator for <laughs> the state of Texas. And he was busted taking off with his family to go to Cancun for a vacation. So. The first damage control effort came out that he was just being a good dad and was just going to help transport them there. No, then they find out, no, you didn't have a return flight until several days later. So then he comes back and he says, well, let me rephrase that, you know, and he's on damage control right now. But it's like they're, they're dipping their toes in the water to see, oh, what will the public buy? Can we get away with this excuse? No? Okay, then let me come back and maybe expand and then I will, you know, admit my mistake. And that's how it always goes. It's like, of course. you know, um, but I will say uh, it seems like I had friends that actually just left to go to Texas for a vacation. They think they're getting away from the, the cold weather here in Michigan. And of course, when they booked it, it was, uh, you know, prior to the, the bad weather moving through the state. But um, and, and so when you go and you're just. I forget my line of train of thought there, Tyler, but I'm just sitting here thinking like, I'm shaking my head. But it's in another example, our politicians are elected to be our voice. They are so far removed, some of them, that they go and they do things like this. Was there not one part of him that said, this may not look good? You know, when I worked for uh, ATF, I was like, every dollar I spend, I need to be comfortable with explaining to the public. And our politicians need to start doing that as well. That was always in the back of my mind. Um, so yeah. they should start doing the same thing. You know what, I would have even bought it if he said before he left, I know our state's going through a terrible time right now. I'm working behind the scenes. What he really should say is, I have a staff that really handles this stuff. I'm just the face of the office, but we're going to continue to work, but I'm going to help get my family here, but I'll be right back. But we all know that's not what he was doing. No. He was taken off for a vacation. No, it, it's, it was very obvious that that wasn't the case, that he wasn't just going down there to take his family with him. He had, as I said before, several days worth of baggage it looked like that he was pulling along. Now he's got more baggage he's pulling along with him through his uh, through his senatorial office as he's trying to weed through uh, this controversy. But you know, it's a time of crisis. This is when pe the people want their leaders to step up and be there and if nothing else be going through the struggle with them and saying, I'm here with you. I'm here to, to represent you and to help us get through this, find solutions, and I'm going to be working nonstop to do this. And, and like you said, if he needed to take his family out of Texas to, to, to Cancun or to wherever else he, he, he was going to end up taking them, he could have just said, listen, I'm, I'm taking my family to a safer, warmer <laughs> location. I will be right back. My staff is taking care of this, as you had said, and then come right back that same day instead of going and not scheduling a return flight, having several days separated before you were going to return and saying, oh, 
you guys got this. This is a different world. Yeah. Politicians don't get away with the things they used to be able to get away with. Cameras are everywhere. Especially, we already learned this, right? During the beginning of the COVID-19, when um, all these mandates went into place, telling, you know, the public, stay at home, don't travel, don't, you know, get together with your friends and your family. And then what did we see? How many elected leaders across the country got busted just doing that? People are going to recognize you in the airport with a mask on. And someone is going to take a picture, and it will be spread through social media. So if you're going to make the policies, you need to follow the policies, most definitely in, in public. Right, Tyler? Yeah, you do. I mean, you need to lead by example. You're setting these rules. You are telling the public that, hey, we're in a crisis. We need to step up for one another. We need to do the right thing and help each other get through this. And then you're taking care of number one, as, as politicians do as a bodily function at this point in our history, and expecting that nobody's going to notice. No, that's not going to happen, especially when you have a reputation and a nickname of Lion Ted Cruz. Come on. <laughs> I will say the weather's not pleasant in Texas. Yeah. It's not pleasant here, but throughout the South as well, because of the weather conditions, we are feeling the impact right here in Michigan because the vaccine shipments to the state are being delayed due to weather throughout other parts of the country. So officials are urging residents to confirm their COVID-19 appointments because winter storm conditions in Kentucky and Tennessee are delaying vaccine shipments to the state. And that's according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention notified Michigan on Wednesday of shipment delays due to weather conditions of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. The delays are affecting shipments across the entire country. Pfizer vaccines were not shipped out on Monday due to the weather, but some shipments are being processed this week. Moderna vaccines, however, were not shipped on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Severe weather affected uh, the distribution center in Memphis, Tennessee, from air and ground transportation to the workforce, including those who pack and sort the vaccine. The state health department said it would continue to monitor the situation and provide updates as more information is learned they are saying hey confirm your appointment however we do know so many of these systems are pretty automated right now they're really good about letting people know if a vaccine shipment is short and they need to cancel or reschedule yeah they're keeping track of all of this and and they're keeping their eyes on it and making sure that if they are scheduling ahead because they're expecting certain kinds of shipments and certain amounts of vaccine whether it be dose number one or dose number two that they're getting people in line and ready for those days when th those vaccines are going to be available. That being said, when there are delays, they have to make adjustments and they have to delay some people's space in line so that they can make those adjustments. And that's part of the reason why you're being urged to get on so many different lists of potential places you can get the COVID-19 vaccine so that when there is that availability and there are delays in one spot or another or several of them, that you're not further delaying your possible, your possible timeline to get the COVID-19 vaccine. You can get yourself in and out of line in as quick of a fashion as possible. Uh, Tyler, I added this next headline uh, to the lineup. While it's uh, focused on Macomb County, I really think it's going to to have some impact uh, throughout the entire state, not just uh, Macomb County, Oakland County, but the entire state, uh, this court case. So Macomb County restaurants file a lawsuit seeking compensation for COVID-19 losses. Macomb County Restaurant Bar and Banquet Association have asked a jury trial for a jury trial in an attempt for Governor Gretchen Whitmer and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to pay for the losses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Macomb County Restaurant Bar and Banquet Association filed the lawsuit that alleges new, different, and unforeseen business expenses attributed to the COVID-19 orders and that they are extreme and that the loss of profits suffered by these businesses are astronomical. The lawsuit is looking for monetary compensation for the potential loss of profits. We have seen a similar lawsuit uh, filed here in the state of Michigan um, just a few weeks ago as well, but that one a little bit different in its language in that it was seeking eminent domain, 
which is an interesting art, um, art, you know, argument as well. But this argument, I think, if they win this lawsuit, this could really, um, I would see that so many restaurants and other businesses would follow suit here. So we're looking for, you know, a legal precedent to be set. Yeah, this is going to be a massive le legal precedent. If they're able to win this case and they're able to say that the government put undue financial harm on our business by putting these regulations in place because so many of our state's businesses have been impacted, uh, have been impacted negatively by the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in the ways that these regulations have altered their business model and their ability to make a profit and stay afloat. That being said, these have been done for public health reasons, and that could be a, a point in the favor of the governor's office because there is some precedent there to be able to take those actions. But if those actions have consequences, those actions have impact, and if that impact is found to be profound enough that the state would be at fault for the losses these businesses have suffered. That's going to be something that's not just going to affect these Macomb County restaurants that have filed this lawsuit, but will probably lead to several more lawsuits, maybe even some class action suits against the state for backed funds due to the COVID-19 losses. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, hey, did you know that the UF, U.S. life expectancy drops a full year due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, life expectancy in the United States dropped a staggering one year during the first half of 2020 as the coronavirus pandemic caused its first wave of deaths. Health officials are reporting minorities suffered the biggest impact with black Americans losing nearly three years Hispanics losing nearly two years. That's according to estimates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's a huge decline. And uh, really, you have to go back to World War II, the 1940s, to find a similar decline. Other health experts say it shows the profound impact of COVID-19, not just on deaths directly due to infection, but also from heart disease, cancer, as well as other conditions. Yeah, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the U.S. in many different ways. And with the number of deaths we've had this year from COVID-19, and on top of that, the number of deaths we've had that have been due to complications from COVID-19 impacting other symptoms and other conditions uh, or in combination with other conditions that people may have. That's a lot of deaths over the course of the year, whether it has been directly COVID related or COVID adjacent, however it may be. And so it's not a huge surprise that U.S. life expectancy did drop significantly this year. But then again, a full year drop in that life expectancy is a significant drop in, in the life expectancy here in the United States. Uh, I didn't add it to the headlines on the website, but driving in, I also heard the story about the uh, latest information on one of the Pfizer studies saying that um, it may be possible for us just to get one dose now of the Pfizer vaccine because it has such a high percentage of antibodies. Uh, and of course, the president is going to be in Portage today here in the state of Michigan taking a personal visit of the manufacturing plant there in Portage. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, that's that would be a, a huge change to have the Pfizer vaccine only be one single dose. Uh, it, it would, of course, bring up the question of how is that second, how would that second dose be impacting people that have received two doses of the Pfizer vaccine? Is it more effective if you have two doses or is one dose adequate and just as effective? Uh, that being said, I mean, if, they, if this can become a one dose vaccine, that Pfizer vaccine can be a one dose solution. A lot of people are going to be a lot, I, I would think would be a lot more inclined to sign up in multiple places, as has been suggested, to potentially get their vaccine instead of what many people are doing, whether right or wrong or, or prudent, waiting for that Johnson & Johnson proposed vaccine that would only be one single shot. The Pfizer vaccine already being highly efficacy, having, having a very uh, high success rate so far, very minimal symptoms, although there are some adverse symptoms uh, that, that come with, uh, side effects that, that come with getting that vaccine. One vaccine, one vaccination shot is a lot different than two, and I think that's going to be something a lot of people are going to be very open to. Should that be something 
that is realized and approved and that change is made. Okay, here's a suggestion. You know how they're on a campaign right now to try to get everyone to get the vaccine? Yes. Don't show close-ups of that huge needle going into people's arms. So when I see that, I'm already right. a nervous Nelly when it comes to getting any type of shot. Even like watching my dog get her blood drawn makes me queasy. So when you're showing that needle go into the arm, just stop it. And I don't understand because I do remember at one time, uh, you know, when I worked in news, we really did not put those close-up shots no one wants uh, to see it. on TV, right? So don't do it. It, it. It's making us nervous Nellies even more nervous. Just maybe, you know, do the wide shot, but sure. don't show it. Even my husband said to me, he's like, that is a big needle, yeah. right? So it might help a little bit if we stop showing uh, that needle going into the arms and going into the arms so far <laughs> under the skin. Right. Um, plus uh, one shot is always better than two. Yeah, I think everyone's gonna prefer one shot over, over two. It's it's less scheduling, it's less of an annoyance. You're not getting the giant needle shoved in your arm twice. And But yeah, on the news angle there, why? Why why that extreme close up of that? That's a that's just an abrasive shot whether you uh, to, to have on your on anybody's screen, especially if they're que they're queasy or squeamish and they don't like getting shots or they don't like seeing that. I'm I'm in the camp of I not if I got to get shots, I got to get shots. It, it is what it is. I don't love it, but I don't exact I'm not exactly averse to it. But I don't want to see a needle going into somebody's arm. All I'm seeing, you know, no, all I'm seeing is someone gets stabbed with a medical device. That's not appealing to the eye. That's not <laughs> encouraging. It's disturbing. Very much so. But you'll find that in all the headlines if you just head to civiccentertv.com. Click on the coronavirus tab, and that's where we post the latest headlines. With that, Tyler, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, as you said, we do have an action-packed show for you here on this Friday. First up on deck is going to be Alexandra Babcock. She is with St. Joseph Mercy Health System. That interview right after the break. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local, and especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl in the studios once again here with Tyler Keefe. As a reminder, you can always catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. 
until noon. If you're unable to tune into us live, you can go ahead and uh, catch a rerun of our interviews. We do replay them throughout the day on Channel 15 on Comcast 99 on AT&T. And as well as that, you can always find it on our website, civiccentertv.com. Uh, you know, one of the disturbing things coming out of the pandemic, Tyler, the rise of childhood obesity. Yeah. Um, when we were kids, or well, I was a kid, we were told, go out and play, don't go, come home until it's dark. Yeah. That was the rule. <laughs> and so you would go to the school, you would play kickball, you would play tennis, anything. Well, so many kids right now are staying in their home. They're not as active. And this was an issue prior to the pandemic. But because of the COVID-19 crisis, childhood obesity continues to be on the rise. But there is help uh, for our local community and some of our kids. Alexandra Babcock joins us now on the MegaCast. She's a lifestyle and culinary medicine coordinator over at St. Joseph Mercy Health System. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. So uh, before we get into uh, the program uh, that you guys are working on with kids, it's a great program too, by the way. Uh, tell us a little bit about your role as the Lifestyle and Culinary Medicine Coordinator. Absolutely. So my role has really evolved over the course of the pandemic, um, mostly because we've been doing a lot of virtual programming. I run a couple programs. I teach residents um, uh, about lifestyle medicine, nutrition education, and culinary medicine, which is really how to apply the concepts of nutrition and healthy eating directly with skills-based learning in the kitchen. And so we work with a lot of hands-on demonstrations. And so I do that for our residents. I also r help run a lifestyle medicine program at St. Joe's Ann Arbor and now I also run the Nutrition Buddies program which combines all of these assets together um, with residents and children who need our help. And so I'm wondering um, once COVID-19 hit there has been more of a focus on our lifestyle and the way we're living and to get healthy food is a medicine it's not just something to put it into our bodies to fuel us but it's also a medicine have you seen more people want to clean up their diets and they're looking to the food that they put into their bodies as a way to help uh, them get in better shape Absolutely. I think that the pandemic has really put a highlight on the need to take care of ourselves, our mental health, our physical bodies. And I don't think people have really recognized until this pandemic the value that health plays in um, in your life and the freedom that it awards you. And so we recognize that people want to learn about how to sleep better, how to manage their stress more, and of course, what to eat and how to really take care of their health for the long term. Well, we've all had to learn to cook a little bit better during this pandemic as well, because so many restaurants have been closed, they're, you know, up and down and this, that, and the other. So sometimes you're like, ah, let me just cook. Absolutely. And those kinds of hands on quick breakfasts and lunch are all things that we hope to help our patients with and our children and our residents. There are more that we can make easy dinners and under 10 minutes, under 20 minutes for our families uh, that are both healthy, affordable and nutritious are something that we definitely aim to do. So with that, I know that when it comes to eating, if we can develop good eating habits while we're young, those habits will help carry us through our lifetime. So share with us more about the Nutrition Buddies Research Program. Absolutely. So our Nutrition Buddies Research Program is a two-way learning program between our resident physicians in Ann Arbor and high-risk adolescents in our community who are struggling with food insecurity. So we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased childhood hunger to one in three children in America. And that number is staggering. And we know that when families are struggling to put food on the table, they will put whatever is available and whatever kind of food they can afford. And so the Nutrition Buddies program looks to combine nutrition education, culinary medicine instruction in our kitchen, as well as food assistance through providing local fruits and vegetables through our farm share at the Farmer St. Joe's. 
we work in partnership to really provide that holistic support that our families need to support them both economically um, as well as nutritionally and helping to our kids and our residents to learn alongside each other that vital information of what do you do to keep your body healthy and how do you apply these culinary skills to, for the long run. And it's great that you're mentioning this. Uh, I will say I did a homeless retreat on um, in Detroit a few years ago. And the one thing that we noticed when you go to shelter, to shelter, to shelter, or to some of these organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, to get food, it's not always fresh food. Or if it was fresh, it was already going bad. So if I'm a parent and I'm struggling and I'm trying to find food, it's hard for me to maybe even get to the farmer's market to get that fresh food, but also how do I get it and, and make it last longer and go further? Of course. The things that we're seeing a lot of our families deal with is that they are focusing on getting what they can available from food banks. And because of the increased rise, a lot of that has to be shelf stable um, or is rapidly going to grocery stores and restaurants and not necessarily being bedded into our food bank system. And so what we know and help can help our families do is how do we utilize some of those pantry staples that we're gonna have on hand, rice and dried beans, um, thinking about, you know, how we can upgrade a pasta sauce to really incorporate more of those fresh fruits and vegetables that we're offering, but also how to find them when they're not necessarily fresh, such as canned or frozen, and how to really incorporate all of that. And we hope to teach our kids and our residents that these foods, just because they not, they're not necessarily what you might see at the farmer's market, they're still nutritious and they're still available to us to incorporate in different ways. What's been the response uh, from the kids that are involved? What are, what's our age group too, by the way? Yeah, so our children are 12 to 14 years of age. So in that kind of preteen, early teenage moment, which has been really fun to capture them um, in this period of time where I feel that they are, are in this transition and they have really enjoyed the program. Some of our children have even commented how they liked uh, working in their own home or because our program had to be moved virtually last year and will continue to be virtual this year, we're cooking over uh, Zoom. And so that opportunity for them to learn in their own space gave them a new set of confidence and a new set of skills that we couldn't have had anticipated had they have come in to our culinary studios to work with our residents. And so they've really enjoyed um, some of the recipes. A favorite is ramen noodles, I'm told. We do a healthy hack on the ramen noodles. So everyone seems to really like that one. Please tell me Spam is not on the menu. Spam is not on my menu. We actually run a pre predominantly plant-based menu with our children. So it's even kind of an additional opportunity to teach them about the value of plants and plant protein and um, how to get lots of colors onto your plate. So how many kids are enrolled in this program? How many are you reaching? Yeah, so we hope to reach 40 children this year. Last year, we were able to reach 30, and so increasing our numbers a bit. Our program has um, been funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, and so with their uh, generosity, we're able to reach those families. And I think about uh, even working from home, you graze a lot more, and so many kids are remote right now. It, and even as they're going back to school, they're still in a hybrid situation. Has the grazing and the empty calories been a part of this program? Yeah, we talk about snacking and how to incorporate healthy options into your day and the value that a snack brings, as well as you know the importance of having regular meals and not skipping them so that you're able to perform well at school and pay attention in that late afternoon period. I think all of us, including our preteens, definitely noticed that kind of two, three o'clock lull in our days and how to avoid that with healthy food and proper snacking and, and what we can be doing to focus more on building a nutritious plate. Alexandra Babcock with us. Uh, she's the Lifestyle and Culinary Medicine Coordinator over at St. Joseph Mercy Health System. Do you get the parents involved in this program as well? Because so many times the parents are the ones doing the actual shopping. 
Yeah, so this year our parents um, were asking them to be um, in the house and kind of in the background. So they don't necessarily have to be involved with hands-on cooking, but they what has really been valuable to see is that the children prepare a meal for their families and parents are very impressed. And they sometimes hear what we're saying in the background about nutrition and sometimes they'll email with questions for themselves. And so it's a different way to reach parents, um, to have your child come to you and say, mom, dad, you know, I want to buy more fruit for a snack or I want to prepare this healthy uh, plant-based taco recipe. These kinds of things have show a lot of power when your teen is coming to you asking you to eat healthier. It, it's hard. Like it, In my household, it's only my husband and I. He is a snacker. And when you look at when he goes to the grocery store versus when I go to the grocery store, he comes home with so much junk food. I'm like, are you a 14-year-old teenager or something? Come on, you know? Uh, But so that can be a difficult discussion within a household, especially if the parents aren't on board. Absolutely. And some of the things that we've noticed that are challenging is those habits, you know, the cravings that you have for food right now are filling a need. You're stressed. There's a lot going on in the world. And so grabbing those things that are easy and convenient, they're serving a purpose. But we want to help people understand that food serves multiple purposes and that those conversations, helping children navigate them with their parents, how to ask for healthier options, having a role in that by being able to prepare food yourself or ask to be part of grocery shopping or food preparation or asking to prepare breakfast one day for the family not only supports those healthier choices but also supports a healthier family dynamic when you're getting everyone together around a table to discuss what happened that day Um, it doesn't have to be at dinner it really can be any time and I would imagine the long-term impact of this is not just about you know your healthy body today, but it's also building those habits because there is a healthcare crisis in our country, and what we put into our bodies and how we live our lives contribute to you know the high cost of healthcare right now. Absolutely. We know even with the recent statistics, I believe you guys were speaking about it earlier with the lowering of our life expectancy in the United States because of the COVID pandemic, we also account for other lifestyle diseases within that. And so when we set children up for success and we set residents up for success to be able to take care of themselves, but their patients as well, we're putting in the option that lifestyle change has a valuable impact on chronic disease. Many lifestyle uh, diseases such as cardiovascular vascular disease, diabetes, um, hypertension, all of these can be prevented, but they can many times also be reversed through lifestyle. And that's what we're really hoping to do with lifestyle medicine in Ann Arbor and opening up that opportunity for our patients um, to learn a lot of what we're teaching our children with Nutrition Buddies is how do we incorporate these lifestyle changes of managing your stress, sleeping better, eating well, exercising regularly to really impact and influence lifestyle change. We're joined by Alexandra Babcock. She's a lifestyle and culinary medicine coordinator at St. Joseph Mercy Health System. And, and Alexandra, how are kids getting involved in this program? How do they go about, or how do their families go about getting them enrolled in this? Uh, maybe not even, maybe not for this year if there's not slots still open, but for those interested in 2022 or beyond. Yeah, we have slots still available for this year. We're starting in the spring, so we're actively recruiting for the Nutrition Buddies Research Program right now. If you are interested in participating, if your child is 12 to 14 years of old and your family is struggling with food access, we encourage you to reach out. Contact us at nutritionbuddies at stjoeshealth.org or our phone number 734-712-7993. And we'd love to speak with your family about how we can help you. If our program is not a fit, we can find one for you you. So I'm curious, um, before we let you go, we are seeing so many of the new cooking shows with the kids, uh, like that Master Chef for Young yeah, Kids. That's impressive. They're, they are stunning. They're incredible. And they're like eight, nine, 10 years old. Does that help share the message of what you're doing is to show some of these programs with kids taking control in a kitchen? Absolutely. I think a lot of parents are hesitant to give their child, you know, a knife or or right. Isn't there a safety issue I there? Yes. Stay away so from we, the stove, exactly. Tyler. No knives. No <laughs> knives. 
we believe that giving kids the skills and teaching them how to use their tools appropriately really can give them that autonomy that we need to help them feel comfortable in the kitchen. And then you can see that some of these really talented children can see opportunity in, in cooking. They can see opportunity as a chef um, or they can see opportunity with nutrition. And that's something that we're really hoping to cultivate is a love of food. I want to transfer my passion for food with um, into our kids. So that's really what we're hoping to do as well. Hey, how long is this program? Program. Our program is uh, four weeks. Our culinary classes are from mid-April to mid-May, and then families are enrolled in our farm share from the beginning of uh, April until the end of the summer at the end of August. So it's a great time to support families and kind of engage with them throughout the whole process. I might have to Zoom bomb one of your classes. I, I'm cooking challenged. I recognize it. <laughs> I'm trying to overcome it. That's why the crock pot is my friend. You know, we have lots of crockpot meals, and I am more than happy to have you come crash a class. By all means, the more the merrier. Alexandra, it's been so great talking to you today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for being here. And the next time, uh, we'd love to uh, have one of your students on with us as well so they can share kind of what they've learned, but also the lessons they've taught their family. Because, uh, you know, some of these kids are much smarter than we are as adults. Oh, absolutely. They are very brilliant, uh, special children. Well, thank you again. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Still a lot to get to in the first hour of the show. Next, though, we will be speaking with our good friend over at the Premier Pet Supply. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studio with Mr. Tyler Keith. We are eight, eight, no, I was going to say eight months. No, we're 11 months into this yeah. pandemic, uh, Tyler. Uh, do you remember back when you guys first started this little show? Oh, vividly. I, I remember the f first days of this pandemic when we were getting ready for last year's State of the Communities and we're you know, preparing to have just a small audience, just, you know, the top leaders in each of the four communities, those speaking, maybe a couple guests per speaker, per participant, and then saying, all right, no, we're not setting up any of the chairs. We're clearing the gym out. It's just going to be the video and the broadcast, and that's it. And then the very next day after the uh, state of the communities is we're clearing things out or striking, as we call it in the business, at uh, Abbott Middle School, we get the notification that on the other side of our company, on Mo uh, for, with Motown Digital that all the events they were doing coming up had been canceled because of COVID-19 and the next week we started the Oakland County Megacast and the week after the second week of the, of the show was when Governor Gretchen Whitmer of course uh, 
enter, uh, entered us into that first stay at home order. And here we are still staying at home 11 months into this. The good thing though is we are able to get out and actually do a little bit of shopping. So we got our dog uh, just before the pandemic and it was a foster dog uh, that has ended up staying with us. But um, there's been an impact on a lot of our pets as well throughout this pandemic because one thing you, you, we were not able to do in the beginning, Tyler, was to socialize her. So she's very protective of my husband and myself. But one thing she loves to do is go to Premier Pet Supply over here at Orchard Mall. And with us now is the owner, Michael Palmer. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks so much for having me. How are you guys? We're great. I have to say I was so proud of our dog, Trixie. The last time we actually let her go into your store, DDR was outside uh, accepting donations. So we took Trixie and we donated a bunch of things from our previous dogs that had passed away. And then to say hi to Christina, Rinaldi, and the team at DDR. And we let Trixie go into your store and pick out her own snack and she didn't bark and she didn't growl at any dogs and she came home and got the most belly rubs ever. Oh yeah. That's great. I think we have to worry about that with our kids too, right? They may not have to know how to socially interact either. You don't want them barking or growling at people. Things have been so weird the last year, but um, we've been able to create, you know, somewhat uh, of, a, of a normal setting in our stores throughout all this. We were very fortunate to have stayed open being deemed essential. And although, you know, it was uh, a challenging time and there wasn't much traffic in our stores, um, people did, you know, venture out and, and they are more now than ever, which is great. And, you know, we're still making sure that we're keeping people safe and distanced, but um, there's not many places you can go in general and feel, feel safe and feel good. There's definitely not many places you can take your dog. So I'm happy that we're able to provide that environment for you. And, and so with that, what was the decision that went in to say, hey, we're going to allow pets here? I know other pet stores do that as well, but this has really become vital during COVID for us. It's part of her socialization training. Sure. You know, I mean, this has just been something that we've done, you know, since our beginnings in 1992 at our original store in Beverly Hills, Michigan. Um, it, it's part of the bonding experience with your pet. And it's, it's part of the, the, the fun thing that you can do. We don't have, you know, uh, restaurants that are very pet friendly. So it's nice that we can be maybe those very few businesses. Now I've seen more people bringing their pets into Home Depots lately, which is kind of cool. Um, but, you know, having an experience with your pet is something that we're, a, a, you know, a huge proponents of. You know, we've got the do-it-yourself dog wash rooms in our stores. That's something you can do with your dog or, or cat or pot belly pig, as someone has done more recently. What? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, wait. Yeah. You had a piggy in your building? Oh. <laughs> we did. Okay. It was pretty fun. I think everybody got a big kick out of that. So um, I have to tell you, my only talent in life is my pig noise. Well, are you going to oh, do that for oh, us right now? Sure. Now you, now you <laughs> it have really to. is. It's like my family thinks I'm so weird, but... <laughs> Yes, I'm just like a piggy. Wow. That's, that's impressive. That's, that's something. <laughs> but I, I, pot belly pigs are cute. They're very they are. adorable, they are. especially when they dress them up. Yes. Um, so, yes, you know, it just experiences in general is just what it's all about. And, and for us as a retail business, right, we've got to be able to continue to provide those things that people can't do online, right? You know, you can't walk your dog through an online shopping experience. And so, you know, it, it's one of our saving graces, if you will, you know, and we create many, unfortunately, the events that we have, which are typically plentiful throughout the year, we've had to, to cancel, you know, and, and but bringing your pet in for a dog wash, bring your pet in just to shop, bring, bring your pet in for uh, the nail trims that we offer in our stores is, is something that people have really kind of have, have appreciated for sure. We've talked so much about how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted people, but we haven't really talked about how it's impacted our pets with that isolation portion of it. So it's so important to have a facility such as yours, like I said, even for her just to go in and she picks out a snack or picks out, you know, a new toy or something, it really is, it's been vital to us, I know it seems like something small to other people, but when you have a new pet and then you go into a pandemic and it's, you know, it's a rescue pet and they go through different things uh, that they go through as they 
you know, adapt to their new home. Um, so you're a favorite spot of hers. And I will say we may be taking her into another pet store. We won't name it. She doesn't like that one. She barks at everyone. But yours, she's very happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important. One of the things that I'm trying to be a, a big advocate for is making sure that people who, who like yourself, who have a new pet at home, so many have, you know, this past year, um, you know, the hope is that, you know, we start to get them geared up and ready for the time when we are going to get back to some normalcy and get back to work and get into our regular schedule. So, you know, maybe leaving them at home a little bit more and, and, and putting them in a crate or whatever the scenario would be if you were to leave them um, little by little and gradually weaning them into understanding that that's going to be part of the, the equation. Uh, will help uh, many pet owners hopefully offset, um, you know, some disobedient actions that they may, you know, think the, the dog's acting out or is no longer in control. It's just pent up energy that they're going to have because they're so used to you being home all the time and people being around. So we've got to be aware and conscious of that for sure. That's such a great point that you brought up. I did notice uh, I was in there uh, this weekend buying pet food, and I saw that you had a your sign of your upcoming event. So you are still participating or at least letting the public know about some of these events. We are. You know, we're trying. You know, we're doing them very carefully and calculated. But, um, you know, we, I mean, we really are pushing, you know, optimistically for things to get back to normal. But we understand it has to be done, you know, in a manner that is – safe and you know and, and leaving people feeling comfortable um but you know we're we're really looking forward to things getting back to normal michael palmer with us here on the mega cast he's the owner for premier pet supply how has business been for you uh, during this time sales up down or pretty level so their their level which to me i i say is a huge success i mean i mean my heart breaks for all those businesses that are struggling and had to close that we're for, so very fortunate to have stayed open I, i'll tell you many people think we're absolutely killing it because like we had, had so many people are, have, have new pets this year but so many people unfortunately are now shopping online so the new pets has, has kind of been our saving grace which is offset and created a balance of the many people who have started to shop online but you know, what I'm trying to do as an independent small family Michigan owned retailer is uh, let people understand that we do provide the same services and that, you know, uh, Chewy.com or an Amazon will. I mean, those are very prevalent businesses right now that are doing astronomical sales. I mean, Chewy.com is estimated to do over seven billion in sales this past year. They haven't uh, sent the reports out yet, but that's almost almost 10 times what they did three or four years ago. And so. You know, us as smaller retailers are losing a lot of business to the online um, conglomerates. So um, we do, you know, through our website, premierpetsupply.com, we provide, um, you know, the ability for people to shop online, to create a curbside order or a local delivery, which we'll do for free within 10 miles of any of our locations. And I'd say about 90, 95% of the orders we get in, I deliver personally. Um, within 24 hours of that order, which is a lot better than what those online uh, stores are doing. That's amazing. Um, were you doing curbside and delivery prior to the pandemic? I wasn't. I, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because I was so excited because a month prior to like the, you know, the bottom falling out, if you will, um, I was primed and ready to uh, to launch curbside and local delivery, and I thought it was so cool because I was going to be the first pet supply store in Metro Detroit that was going to offer this. And then the pandemic hits and everybody does it now. And so I'm not so special, but we're doing everything we can uh, to make sure that we're, we're taking care of people, keeping them home if they want to stay home, providing that, you know, that service um, if they don't want to come into the store at all. But also, you know, for me, it's just preserving that business that, you know, we uh, had the potential to lose. So with that, too, I will say um, I've kind of cheated on the lady where we first originally found our dog food from. So we make our dog's food. It's this crazy thing. It's an all day thing. And my it, she's a big dog. She's like 70 pounds. So my husband, you know, was like, we have to make our own food because, you know, she'll live longer. They'll be healthier. But we mix it with dried dog food that you can get from your store there. Um, we were going to start ordering it online. But just what you were saying, we wanted to support local so we started going to a pet supply place in Troy but then during the pandemic her hours were so crazy like only on Wednesdays from 2 until 4 it was hard and it was further away and so when we discovered you guys had it and you're right here around the corner we're like we're still supporting local 
you've Thank always you. Uh, you know had our supply and the service has always been amazing so you know sometimes I feel bad about cheating but I feel good because I love coming to your store well I appreciate that we are um, we, we really go out of our way I wouldn't even say out of our way it just comes natural for us to make sure that your money being spent locally stays local you know, we support so many groups, especially those that are benefiting the welfare of animals that are local, um, you know, and, and supporting Michigan companies in our stores, doing everything we can to make sure that we are making you proud to support us by supporting and keeping that money local. And it is said that 60 to 80% of money spent locally stays local. And I, I will attest that's absolutely true. And there is something also to getting that service from people that know you and, and know your pets and have have had that experience with you and, and have gone through answering your questions in the process of raising this pet alongside you, giving you that advice and being there along the way with you to provide that, that you can't necessarily get at a large chain or online. I appreciate you recognizing that. It's really important to us that we keep our staff trained at a really high level when it comes to nutrition, uh, when it comes to the knowledge of the products that we sell. I always say we've got great customer service, but any business can claim great customer service, but our service goes beyond with uh, product knowledge and understanding and, and just compassion and the time to care, because we understand, and, and everyone in our teams, you know, in each of our stores, they understand that, you know, there's a lot of options out there, you know, and people can shop online or, you know, buy their pet supplies at, at many other stores, but they choose to come into our stores, and we want to make sure that you know, they feel special and, and they're appreciated when they do walk in our stores. And that's so important. Michael, just a couple more minutes here with you on the Megacast before we let you go. Tell us about um, how you're supporting Leader Dogs for the Blind. I love that program. Oh, thank you. So we uh, actually, I've served on one of their boards for over three years now. It's just such a great group, you know, that of Rochester Hills, Michigan, local, um, but their reach is international. and. Um, it's very expensive to place a dog with someone of, uh, with special needs. I don't think people recognize that. On average, it's around $40,000 for each dog to get placed. And Leader Dogs for the Blind doesn't receive any um, public funding. It's all private and corporate uh, donations. So uh, us supporting Leader Dogs is, is uh, near and dear to Premier Pet Supply in my heart. And it just, uh, it's a great fit. So what we do throughout the year, we do what's called the Dog Days of Summer Campaign. And um, people are able to buy little dog tags that they can put you know, uh, their dog's name on. And we plaster throughout the, the walls of our stores uh, throughout the summer. And uh, we also contribute, Premier Pet Supply does. Uh, and we were able to give them um, a, a check for $17,000 last year through the help of all of our customers' donations and uh, the contribution that we had made ourselves. So um, that was something we were very, very proud of. And every year our goal and our plan is to donate even more money. So for 2021, I'd love to hit that $20,000 market. You know, that would be great. It would be great. It is a great program. I will say I'd have a hard time uh, being one of the trainers because you get these puppies and you train them and then you hand them over. Like I saw a video, a story. I, I was crying for the lady as she was giving the dog uh, up, but uh, it is a great program. So thank you for supporting it. Um, yeah. Before we let you go, we of course know you're here in our community at the Orchard Mall. Where, uh, where are your other locations? So uh, we're in uh, Beverly Hills at 13 and Southfield. We also have Rochester Hills, Novi, Livonia, Canton, Shelby Township. Um, and we are uh, excited to announce that we're working on and we have uh, construction started on a downtown Detroit location. So that we hope to open in the spring this year. Oh, that'd be great. So many people are moving into Detroit to bring in their pets along with them. Yes, yeah, that's, uh, it's really fun to see so many people down there and. Um, you know, and, and walking their dogs and being active in the streets. And we're looking to be a great part of that and truly provide the, the, the residents down there with a, the first full line, full scale pet supply store uh, in the heart of the city. That'd be awesome. We were at Buddy's Pizza downtown last week and someone was out there with a puppy, St. Bernard. The thing oh. was huge and it was oh, a yeah. puppy. Hey, uh, Michael, though, uh, quickly before we let you go, I have to say we were having a conversation. My dog loves bully sticks. Yep. And then we realized what bully sticks were. <laughs> and we're it's like, we're supporting my dog <laughs> eating bully sticks. Just just Google what a bully stick is. We'll leave it at that. 
Yeah, I typically okay. just keep it real simple. It's just the muscle and it's from the cow. <laughs> well, Michael, thank you again for being with us and uh, we wish you the best of luck uh, in 2021 as well. Thank you both. I really appreciate you having me on. And also say hi to your team. You have a great team over there at uh, the Orchard Mall. I absolutely will. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we're going to check in with the West Bloomfield Fire Chief, Greg Flynn. He is at the vaccination clinic, so we're going to get a quick update from him. My name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan every time you leave home. We want to say thank you for staying with us for the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast. As a reminder, you're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. You can always, always catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham area municipal access, and also tune us in to Channel 15 on Comcast and 99 on AT&T. Joining us now on the Megacast, kicking off the second hour, let's go to Chief Greg Flynn with the West Bloomfield Fire Department. I know you're there at Fire Station 1 for an update on the uh, drive through vaccination service. Hey, Chief. Good morning, Ronnie and Tyler. Uh, kudos to both of you on the town hall meeting you hosted the other day about the vaccine and uh, uh, the great work that uh, the county health department's doing here behind me today. And, and definitely you guys sharing good uh, science-based information with our partners over at Henry Ford. Yeah, it's really great to get the information directly from the individuals that know so much more than we do because reading an article on Facebook does not make me a health expert. Oh, and you know, these are the faces that our residents see when they go into the hospital. It's not uncommon to see Eric Wallace walking down Main Street at Henry Ford. So the very faces that, you know, are accountable to the care provided here right within our community are the very faces that we're sharing that information. And, and that's what the Megacast always does. It keeps it local. Well, we're lucky to have uh, such great partners, but also uh, partners such as yourself and your team there. Uh, Larry, our Zoom producer, a couple weeks ago, he had to take his mother to get her vaccination shot. And I will say it wasn't quite as smooth of an operation as you have going on there. Whatever is going on, you guys need to roll this out countywide. It's great. Well, this is the, the county team and they deserve all of the credit. You, you'll see some of their uh, team members walking around in the uh, yellow vest. Uh, they're gonna put over 619 cars through here today uh, for their vaccines. Uh, this is uh, the second clinic. So this is the folks who were here three weeks ago to get shot number one of the Pfizer and uh, they're back today for their second shot. And I had a, the opportunity to talk with some of the residents and, and some of the greater West Bloomfield residents that are here today. Um, and just, they were just complimenting again, the staff, how friendly the county staff is and the ease of access to get in right through the station. You're seeing some, maybe seeing just the catching some of the volunteers, checking folks in, then they move inside. They're gonna get their actual vaccine. Then they'll move straight across, never going back out onto Orchard Lake Road into the observation lot where there's a nurse standing by and observing them for about 15 minutes while they wait uh, to make sure they don't have a reaction after the administration of the vaccine. Uh, you always pick the bad weather days though. The first one <laughs> was that crazy snow. Today we had a little bit of snow overnight, but not exactly too warm out there, Chief. Well, we're doing well. And, and what you can't see inside is uh, we've got a couple more of those like patio heaters for the staff. 
Um, so those are putting down a nice, uh, some nice radiant heat down for the staff to stay warm, to keep the vaccine at the appropriate temperatures. Uh, they're watching all of that. And actually all the vaccine is maintained and drawn up inside. And what will happen is just as cars are coming up, runners bring just enough vaccine out to the nurses so that there's never an oversupply of vaccine just sitting there. Uh, it's all being closely monitored. <laughs> Ronnie and Tyler, I'm so impressed by this county team, uh, just the way they show up. And even when they do a shift change, these cars don't stop moving. They do a shift change so smooth that it just it just keeps going. And, and I do need to give a shout out to West Bloomfield PD, who's out there on Orchard Lake Road, uh, helping to manage and make sure that everybody can get in and out of the fire station safely. So thanks to uh, Chief Patton and his team. So Chief, I do know that uh, this is the second time that we're doing this with you. As you mentioned, we did it the first time uh, at the first round of the vaccine doses. But again, how exactly does this work because I did stop by this morning and it's like an orchestra and the cars come in and boom it's one right after another after another are they checking in on their phone how is this working right and and thank you for stopping in this morning um the uh the folks are going to come in and they actually get checked in they're greeted by staff as they come in to assure that they have an appointment They'll check in here, they get them in line, they start making sure that they have everything, the QR code and everything that they need ready to go. Just inside the door, there's another check-in spot where their appointment comes up. They ask them some pre-screening questions, then they move through and then they get the actual a shot. But Ronnie, can't, you guys talked about this in the town hall yesterday. We talked about it weeks ago. and We, we need to keep reinforcing this message. Get in line, get in line in as many lines that you can get in and let the team that's getting the vaccine go through the eligibility list and get people where they need to be. It is happening. People are getting vaccine. This is proof of it. And uh, there's multiple vaccine clinics going on today, multiple vaccines going on, vaccine clinics that'll continue through the weekend. Oakland County is getting vaccine out faster than anybody I know. You pull up that Michigan Department of Human Health and Services website and you look at that dashboard and which county is green? Bright green. Only county in the whole great state of Michigan, Oakland County. And uh, I think residents of Oakland County should be proud of that and be celebrating just how quickly they move vaccine from delivery to distribution into people's arms. And they're rock stars, and we need to celebrate that. Chief Greg Flynn with us on the Oakland County Megacast, joining us live on site from a COVID-19 vaccination site. So this is round two for, for people that got their shots just a few weeks ago, Chief Flynn. At this time, are there any more planned vaccine drive throughs in West Bloomfield that will be coming up in the coming days and weeks? So that's a great question, Tyler. And what happens is the county my last update, and this was a couple weeks ago, and I think this is still uh, holding true. They're getting notice today or around today for what their delivery, estimated delivery for vaccine is going to be next week. And so then they'll reach out to partners like us and say, hey, we have this uh, amount of vaccine we'd like to distribute on Friday. And Friday seemed to be our day. And like Ronnie said, Fridays with snow and extremely cold temperatures are the ones that we seem to excel at. <laughs> and uh, once we get word of that, our team is ready to mobilize. I want to assure everybody that our response, our preparation to respond to 911 calls while they're not running out of fire station one, uh, those units have been redistributed throughout the township and are ready to respond. You know, I think it's important to understand the role of local government in a, in a health crisis like this is to, to provide this type of service. And uh, it's the prevention of the disease transmission, it's the mitigation of the disease transmission that we can, we can support and, and team up with partners like Oakland County Health. And that's what we're doing. So yes, we plan to do more uh, when the county calls upon us to help out. We're gonna be there to answer with a resounding yes and uh, keep getting vaccines into, into people's arms because that's what they want, that's what they expect. Well, it, we're so lucky to have you and your team and the county health team to be able to do this. As Dr. Faust was saying yesterday, over 400,000 people have signed up for that Save Your Spot program through Oakland County. Uh, Chief, that seems the best way for people to do it. But like you said, get on as many lists you can get on, whether it's Meyer or, or Henry 
Ford Health Systems get on the list, but what they don't want to do is sign up over and over and over again on that save your spot because all you're doing is bogging down the system. It's not a lottery system. So right. the more times you sign up, it's not going to up your chances or, you know, get you an earlier appointment. However, it seems to be working so far, and this drive through vaccination clinic is proof of that today. It is. And, uh, you know, again, we go back to uh, the concerns that uh, people weren't going to get the vaccine. People weren't going to take the vaccine. And now how quickly the news cycle changes. Uh, when again, good information comes out, like our friends at Henry Ford uh, Health System, when they when they talk about what the science says, but Dr. Chen, who's come and give uh, presentations at the fire department years ago on disease transmission, again, uh, a stakeholder in the community of, and of the community of community health and continuing that message. You guys had some great questions in the town hall about, you know, if someone was a mom was nursing or somebody was pregnant and just, I loved the flow of those sincere local questions that people had and when we can remove those bar barriers get them signed up then we can get them in line here at fire station one and we can get them a vaccine and it's just that that anxiety that goes away when people feel that they have this protection uh to the virus and it's valuable and uh we're just we're very pleased and honored to, to play a small role uh, in the distribution of that vaccine. There were a lot of thumbs up uh, this morning. Are you seeing that from people? They're very excited to get the vaccine. Oh my goodness. Everybody that's coming through has a smile on their face. It's usually not until we get to the end where we get a couple of those people, and we've talked about this, that just want to make a quick right turn into the fire station and say, oh, do you have extra vaccine? I want to let you know, this team in here has it down to the exact dose. So there isn't extra vaccine. This is a little bit of some, uh, I'm not saying it hasn't happened where there's been extra vaccine, but there's a plan for any time that there's a vaccine that might be uh, left over uh, for distribution. Yeah, always a, a good point uh, to make, Chief. Uh, seems like we lost your video there, but we want to say thank you again. And uh, we appreciate all of your effort and your help uh, out there trying to get the vaccines in the arms of the members of our community. Chief Flynn with us here on the Megacast. We want to say have a happy weekend and stay warm out there. Will do. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we are going to uh, continue our uh, look into some how n some of the businesses and nonprofits have been impacted by COVID-19. I feel like some of these uh, nonprofits especially have had to reinvent themselves like two, three, four times over and over again. And so with us after the break, we'll be speaking with the Director of Communications for the Easter Seals of Michigan. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months you know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. 
To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Megacast. As a reminder, you can always catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham area, Municipal Access, as well as Channel 15 on Comcast 99 if you have AT&T. We also make it easy. If you're out driving around, you do not have to miss an episode. Tune us in on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. We also want to say thank you to our Facebook partner of the day, Orchard Mall for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. So as we all continue to try to navigate this crazy world in the COVID-19 pandemic, I often wonder what it's been like for those with disabilities during this time. Joining us now on the Megacast is Craig Sherum. He is the Director of Communications and Outreach for Easter Seals Michigan. Craig, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So I remember uh, Easter seals. You used to get the stamps all right. the time, right? Back in the, in yeah. the day, I'm like, people even mail letters anymore. Uh, they, they, still do, they still do the stamps. They every do. Every year. So, yeah. I, am I dating myself with that one uh, there, Craig? <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, that, that, I think that's uh, what really put Easter seals on the map in terms of becoming a household name. That was a campaign that was started back in the early 30s and uh, still goes on to this day. So yeah, it's it's been a, a long-standing uh, kind of uh, more associated with, so we love it. That's awesome, a marketing 101 back in the 30s. But with yeah. that, uh, while we know what Easter Seals is, a lot of people don't really know what you guys do day to day. Fill us in. Yeah, sure. So. Um, and probably one of the biggest reasons that people might not be familiar with exactly what we do is because we constantly are evolving and changing. When we opened our doors 100 years ago, um, it was to provide needs for the community. And so one of the, the main uh, kind of missions for us is to constantly change to meet those needs, whatever those needs are. So um, we started offering services for children with physical disabilities back in the 1920s and 30s. And then we've kind of evolved uh, to add adults. And then now our biggest service line is mental health services. And we also have autism services and services for farmers. We have a lot of Michigan farmers with, uh, with rehabilitation and also helping them to continue farming. Well, I, you have so many different areas that you're focused on, but when you say mental health right now during the middle of the pandemic, that has really become an issue. I think before the crisis, people didn't want to talk about, but now that we are in the middle of this pandemic and this crisis, are more people seeking help, at least through your organization? Absolutely. We actually, uh, in 2020, we grew by 9%. Um, and so we offer a free screening on our website. And this free screening is about two minutes, the mental health screening. Um, it's anonymous, it's online. Uh, you can go in and you're not gonna end up on a mailing list. Um, we had more people take that screening last year than the previous five years combined. So there's definite uh, uh, attention given to, to mental health, especially last year, and people are seeking services for that, for sure. But when we say mental health, what does that involve? Because there are so many facets. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think sometimes people, when they think of mental health, they think of this uh, maybe an outdated association with it. But it can also it can be anything from um, depression, anxiety, stress, um, ADD, ADHD. Um, these are behavioral health disabilities. Um, and what we saw in the past year was a lot of people. You know, when you when you become quarantined, you kind of lose a little bit of what your role is in society. You know, you I think by like the second week in sweatpants, you're thinking, well, what the heck? What do I? What am I? doing you know I, I need to kind of do something and um, so a, a, a lot of people started experiencing definite side effects of, of quarantine we're social beings we need to interact with each other in whatever ways we can so um, a lot of things uh, get kind of get into kind of lumped in with mental health and that's what they are they're they're anything that kind of prevents you from from being able to accomplish your goals or do the things that you set out to do because of some sort of stress and anxiety was a big one last year for sure yeah, that pretty much describes everyone right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but with that, the need is greater. How is your funding right now? 
So uh, immediately when the funding, so we, we rely uh, heavily on events. I mean, that was one of our, our big things. We're, we're an organization that is so dedicated to the community that we love nothing more than being in the community. So uh, we had to adjust and we had to take a lot of things virtual. Um, we had to come up with some really uh, creative, inventive ways. We looked for a lot of sponsorships. We had some community partners that came to the table and really helped us out. Um, and we, we kind of had to change the, our direction. We had some some of our biggest fundraiser in the, of the year takes place in December and we weren't able to do that. We had to kind of break it up into several virtual events and um, those luckily were, were successful for us. But when we're talking about virtual, um, because I think by this time in the beginning, it mm -hmm. was kind of like, okay, but by now we're all zoomed out. And Absolutely. you know, credit to everyone for trying to be creative during this time to do these types of events, but are you still getting the donations that you need going virtual? Yes. So what we want to th exactly what, because of that, we are this whole month of February, we're doing a no event event. It's the, <laughs> it's the greatest event that's never going to take place. And uh, what we're doing is we're doing coping boxes. So like if you were to go onto our website, easterseelsmichigan.com, you can purchase uh, one of these uh, boxes that we uh, have a chief medical officer and several of our uh highly skilled clinicians help select items that help uh, reduce stress and reduce anxiety and uh, kind of not only do we have the pandemic taking place but we also have the winter blues which we all have you know every year anyway now that's added on to it so you can go out there and then you can buy one of these boxes that is uh, full of items and then we also give a box to an individual in need so um, those sort of uh, things have, have been kind of the way that we've been uh, raising funds and they have been successful for us. Um, with us, 96 cents out of every dollar goes back into the services. And those services are services that take place in Michigan. So we've uh, we have also had a, a, a number of people that have contributed online. We're extremely thankful for them as well to help, to help us keep serving the, the community. Craig Sherum with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the Director of Communications and Outreach for Easter Seals Michigan. One of the great programs that you do focuses on autism as mm -hmm. well. For those, again, autistic, there are so many uh, different levels on the spectrum, they say. What are some of the programs do you uh, have for autistic we, people? Yeah, we offer the Play Project, which is um, really, uh, it, it's, it's this program that is committed to helping to understand the way that the, the child, like you said, because the child, every child is different on the spectrum, this helps the parent kind of connect with the child and kind of enter into their world and kind of understand what uh, they're, they're thinking and how what works and, 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 and how they can improve on that. We also offer ABA therapy, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy. When the pandemic hit, a lot of these children were in the middle of potty training. And when you have children uh, on the spectrum that are potty trained, it's extremely difficult. So we did the first thing we've ever, the first time we've ever done this. We did virtual potty training, so we were able to potty train a number of kids virtually, and it was pretty successful. And the fact that we were able to kind of adjust to that because we didn't want those children to regress. And so now, thanks to vaccinations and thanks to um, a, a number of different. Uh, 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 safety protocols and things we're doing, we're kind of, we're getting into um, doing the face-to-face -face again, which has been kind of great. Uh, we, we, the, it's most beneficial, but yeah, we, we've we been uh, able to still execute those programs and they've, they've been wonderful. I think about what some of these parents might be going through. You know, we talk about the stress of homeschooling and homework, but when you have some, you know, a special needs child, that stress can then go so many levels higher during the pandemic because they're yeah. you know the routine is broken and they need that routine. Absolutely, we actually during uh, all of last year we would host little Zoom parties, which were you know just the kids could log in and just see their friends that they know through the program. Uh, the parents were able to kind of see each other. We ha held little talent shows and things like that that gave them something to do and the parents were extremely thankful. Um, in, in December, we did a virtual uh, meeting with Santa Claus so that children on the spectrum um, who were, you know, parents were kind of thinking, they were saying, our, our child's not gonna be able to go 
tell Santa what they want. So we were able to come up with that as well. So we've been able to leverage technology in a lot of ways so that our services continue. And in many ways, uh, we were able to enhance some uh, experiences for them as well. But yeah, it's definitely true. It, 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 it it can really stress a lot of uh, families out uh, not being able to have that routine. So, Craig, with that, uh, just another minute or two with you here on the Megacast, I have to ask, anything positive that has come out of this for Easter Seals Michigan that maybe will stick around if we ever get back to normal? Uh, yeah, so we uh, started implementing telehealth services. Um, I mean, really taking it to another level. Um, and it, it, what that came with that was a lot of computer literacy for the people that we serve. So they were saying things like, thank you for teaching me how to use an iPhone and now I'm FaceTiming my family and, and not only am I making my appointments, but I'm also able to communicate with my family, which has helped a lot, uh, read books on, on their phones. I think sometimes we take for granted how computer literate some of us are. We, I mean, my, I have two kids and they can pull up all this stuff. I call them in all the time to help me out. Um, we were able to implement that. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, honestly, was just watching, we have 500 uh, employees and watching them go above and beyond every day to make sure that the people we serve, the services were not interrupted. We didn't have to close our doors. We were you know, offering these services. Medication was still being distributed, um, was truly inspiring. And I think it just reminded me of the commitment that the organization has to the people in our community. It was, it was really powerful and it was something that will carry with me forever. Just uh, watching that that uh, sheer devotion to the community was was amazing. It really is amazing to see how our hearts come together in the middle mm -hmm. of a crisis, because at the end of the day, the work that still needs to be done, the people still need to be served. And uh, Craig, I'm, I'm with you. I'm still trying to learn Snapchat. Like I have the yeah. basics, but I couldn't imagine trying to learn that virtually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh. I'm Snapchat challenged. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, me too. Go oh, good. I'm not alone. Hey, uh, not alone. Craig, before we let you go, um, where can people find out more about the uh, services and about your organization? Absolutely. They can go to EasterSealsMichigan.com, and uh, that is our website, and it has a lot of information on there, including um, stuff about our services, the screening, which is free, um, and you can check that out, and we encourage people to do that as well. And get a care box. Yes, please. It helps so many people. And, and we, in 20 items, we hid uh, some high end value uh, items into those boxes. So you could end up with, you know, a new Fitbit or an iPad. Um, we have some very generous uh, sponsors that helped us. So I uh, kind of did a little Willy Wonka on that. So you can, you can uh, maybe walk away with something pretty cool too. That is so awesome. Thank you again for everything Thank that you. you guys are doing. And will you extend our gratitude to your team as well? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Craig, share him with us. He's the Director of Communications and Outreach for Easter Seals of Michigan. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And then when we come back, we are going to be uh, speaking with the Charles Wright Museum. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Thank you for being with us on this Friday morning. It is Black History Month. And uh, as you turn on the news, we see so many stories about so many inspiring people here in our community. But our next guest, the Charles H. Wright Museum, they have been paying tribute to the African-American community for 
hundred years. How long have you guys actually been open? It's over a hundred years now, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, this is actually our 55th year celebrating. Yeah, 1965 is when we began. So, Where did I get a hundred? Oh no, but it's fine. We'll take it. <laughs> um, you're forecasting some very good things for us in the future. There you go. We'll be oh, together and celebrate the 100th celebration. But uh, I've been in the museum. It is, it is all inspiring to yeah. go into the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum for those that maybe have not taken the time to visit the museum. But uh, can we start off first with Black History Month? What events do you guys have going on right now? Oh, we're excited about Black History Month. As, as many people will know that because of the pandemic, we've gone virtual with a lot of the events and activities that we've had to put on. We do still have a variety of uh, different uh, in-person type of events that we invite people to come out and participate in. Uh, and uh, some of them really center around our exhibits. Um, so, you know, on, on Wednesdays, for example, we have uh, the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers. So, uh, and again, virtually online. So they have to go to the right.org and they'll see a full list of all of our, you know, events and activities. And so, you know, the virtual storytelling on Wednesdays and then on Thursdays in person, if you come to the museum, Thursday afternoon at one o'clock, every Thursday during Black History Month, we have what's called Excellence in Black Cinema. And these uh, are, are just a variety of different movies that either starred uh, famous Af uh, African-Americans or were produced or directed by African-Americans. So we invite the public to come down to the museum on Thursday afternoon around one o'clock and, uh, and participate then. On Fridays, we uh, virtually have what's called a Youth Speak virtual stage. So for young people, they have the opportunity to uh, express their perspective on history and on science and justice and equality, um, which, which is really kind of um, fun, given that, you know, so, so long we've had young people who are being taught at, right? They go six, seven hours a day sitting in front of a screen with a teacher talking at them. Um, and this gives the, this turns the camera on them and allows them to be able to kind of express themselves with things that they are feeling about history and equality and justice. Um, Saturdays at, at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, they can make their own comics. Uh, so we have a workshop on how to make your own own comic, and they can do either a, one individual or you know a series. Um, but it's a fun workshop for young people. So those are some of the very basic things that are happening during Black History Month that we like to be able to tell people uh, that they can participate in virtually and uh, in person. Edward Foxworth the third with us here on the Megacast. He's the Director of External Affairs for the Charles H. Bright Museum of African American History. When you're talking with the kids, what are you hearing from them right now? Because they're in the middle of a pandemic, but we also just went through a crazy election and yeah. a summer of un unrest in our country. How are they taking all of this? They're stressed. They're, they're, they're dealing with a lot of duress. Uh, and as I mentioned, they, they, you know, six, seven hours a day sitting in front of a, a screen uh, five days a week. Uh, it has been very stressful um, not being able to go outside and then when they do they have limited kind of room or ability to be able to interact with people um, but then they see that their parents are in fact dealing with the stress of yes that election there was an eviction moratorium um, high unemployment there were all kinds of issues that were affecting their household and so for them, yes, they, when it gets to equality um, and justice, they're really kind of, uh, you know, thrown off. They also were, were bothered by the, uh, the daylight killing of George Floyd and the protests that came thereafter. So they're seeing this firsthand. They're not being told it. Um, it's on their TV screen. It's on the news. It's in the papers. And you just can't avoid having to deal with it. And so uh, they're, they're asking a lot of good questions. Why? What, why is this happening? You know, what, what do we do about it? I'm frustrated, I'm mad. And so uh, we're having to try to be social workers and historians all at the same time. And they have the ability to get information 
so much more readily than we did when we were kids. We yeah. went to the library, had to look yeah. things up. You knew the you know Dewey Decimal System. Now they just open it up on their phones, but it can also give them the historical context as to what's going on and what they're seeing today as well. But you wonder, does that raise their hope or not? Because sometimes it feels like as a nation, we haven't made too much advancement in the area of racial, uh, you know, the racial area within our country. Yeah, I know I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that uh, the stress that they're experiencing and the vivid images that they're seeing, uh, and, and, and Ronnie, I won't uh, sign up with you publicly on the Dewey uh, Decimal System. I'm, I'm just not going <laughs> to age myself with that, uh, though I'm very familiar. That's a great reference that you made there. Um, but no, we certainly do have, uh, you know, some work to do in this nation that we have uh, the division and the last presidency didn't help that in a lot of ways. Uh, the insurrection on the Capitol didn't help that in a lot of ways. Uh, we really have some some more work to do, and I would venture to say that we might have taken a couple of steps backward as opposed to you know moving forward. And and so what you're seeing now in corporations is the pop up of diversity, equity, and inclusion officers uh, in their effort to try to come on board. Uh, you're seeing more and more. Uh, conversations that are hopefully happening through symposiums and conferences and workshops, though they are virtual, uh, they are happening. But yes, you're right. Young people do have access to uh, media just as easy as we do. They can't, you know, scroll through their uh, cell phones without coming across something that's related to diversity, inclusion, or racial equity. Our history has so many dark spots, but it also has a lot of high spots and. For the kids to grow up here in Metro Detroit and within the Detroit area to go to the museum and they get that opportunity to see how big of an impact Detroiters played in the role of our history, not just here as our city and our state, but in the country as well. Yeah, no, you're so right. And our And Still We Rise exhibit is our permanent exhibit that goes from 1500 BC all the way through to present day. Um, and they get a chance to kind of see uh, the, um, the journey that African and African-American people have had to experience uh, in this country. Uh, all the way through, uh, you know, from the very beginning when, when, when slave owners went over to Africa with boats and, uh, and then, you know, brought back Africans as cargo, uh, treated less than uh, an animal, but then moving all the way through the, uh, the entire, again, journey of being traded and, um, uh, you know, sold uh, at an auction block, placed on plantations uh, and made to work. And that history is very vivid in our And Still We Rise exhibit. And it, and it showcases also, uh, and why we call it And Still We Rise, because you know you saw the colored troops uh, fighting the Civil War uh, in this exhibit. You then got a chance to see how Ford Motor Company offered $5 a day for uh, employees and the Great Migration and how that happened, uh, all the way through to Black Bottom, which we are all familiar with in Detroit uh, and its history. The thing that they'll see in and still we rise is that every time that African Americans made uh, a lunge ahead in race relations or even for themselves, um, there was always something that would would knock them back down. So you had lynchings, you had Jim Crow uh, laws, uh, you had a variety of different things. And again, uh, they get a chance to see that in and still we rise. Um, but we have a couple of other exhibits that we invite them to see that's around we have a new one that's going to be uh, leaving us uh, beginning of May called Voting Matters. And as you mentioned, uh, with the recent election, it's important for them to understand why voting does matter. Uh, they get a chance to hear about women's suffrage movement and gerrymandering, uh, post-reconstruction. Uh, they get a chance to hear about the poll testing that, you know, so many people, when uh, it was time to vote, uh, they were told they had to count the number of bubbles on a bar of soap in order to be able to have the right to vote. Or either, you know, they were, you know, presented with a random jar of jelly beans. Count how many, tell us how many jelly beans are in here. If you can't, then you can't vote. Um, so there, there is some very real history that we invite people to come, up, come down and learn more about. 
I was uh, lucky enough when I worked for ATF, I had to do the recruiting, although I never quite figured that one out as a media person. <laughs> how I got stuck with that job because I wasn't an agent, but I was their diversity and inclusion officer. And one of the things I was able to bring to was uh, bring in one of the Tuskegee Airmen to actually come in and speak to the office. And such a gift to have the museum here in our backyard. So many of us don't even realize that we have the museum here in, in Detroit, but to hear these firsthand accounts of the experience that uh, the the airmen went through and the racism. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, you know, Lieutenant, he, Lieutenant was a POW and he was like, I was treated better as a POW mm -hmm. than I was when I came back. He went on to be a principal in the school or city of Detroit. But when we hear those stories, how important is it for the kids to hear them directly from people who lived it? Yeah, no, you you hit the nail on the head, and I don't know if you know, but you, you're you're uh, those that are watching your show would be happy to know now that the Tuskegee Airmen National Museum is now located in the Charles H. Wright Museum, uh, and we have individuals here all the time. There are only a couple of living Tuskegee Airmen, and we had one here on uh, Thursday, uh, yeah, actually, who came in. And uh, they pop in all the time. So the, they're gonna be here inside the museum uh, for the next 10 years or in the foreseeable future, uh, where individuals, when they come in and pay for their admission, they can actually go and visit the Tuskegee Airmen National Museum. But yeah, imagine that, being able to hear a firsthand account from an actual Tuskegee Airmen about what they experienced, what it was like, uh, and to hear some words of wisdom not from a, a history book or, or a video, but to have a, a real live person who, who went through these kinds of uh, challenges is really, really uh, special. Well, it gives you an appreciation for everything that we have, but it also reminds you we have a lot of work yet to do. Edward Foxworth, Foxworth with us here. He's the Director of External Affairs for the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And with that, Edward, uh, just another minute or two with you on the show. How can people uh, visit the museum? I know things are limited right now. Do they need an appointment? Yes, great question. Thank you. Um, they do need an appointment. And so we encourage everyone to go to the right.org. That's T H E W R I G H T dot org. And they'll see all of the virtual events that we have go going on. Uh, all of them are free of charge right now. Um, they'll be able to then schedule a date in time that they want to come into the museum. Uh, it is timed admission because we've got to have the social distancing and capacity rules and protocols are all in place. So we certainly are making sure that this is a safe environment. We've got sanitation sta stations all around. They do have to come wearing a mask of their own. And if they need one, uh, you know, simply ask and we'll provide them with them. So we're, we're abiding by all of the safety protocols related to COVID. Um, but if they go to the, the right.org, they're going to find out any and everything that they need to know. And then worst case, send us an email. I'm the guy who's going to answer it, <laughs> make sure that they get uh, get a response. Hey, before we let you go, how's fundraising right now for Fundraising is a little slow. As you know, that, um, you know, individuals and corporations alike have all been hit uh, pretty hard. That's a great question. We you know, we, we're always in need of support and we've had to furlough, uh, you know, more than a dozen of our employees. Um, we, we, we could use any donations, charitable donations to the museum. And again, that's on the right.org. If they just click the, the give tab, uh, then they can certainly uh, make a non, uh, make a tax deductible donation to the museum. And you know, this is Black History Month. If we all give up one coffee, one visit to Starbucks, everyone in Metro Detroit does that. That could be a lot of extra money for your organization and the important work that all of you are doing. Thank you again for your dedication uh, to the history, but also, also to our community and sharing these stories and keeping the stories alive. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. We appreciate it. It's been great speaking with you today. Edward Foxworth with us here with the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum. If you have not been, you need to take a day and go. You don't have to take your kids. You can even go by yourself. It is, uh, we are so lucky to have this in our backyard. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we'll round out the week. 
talking about something Tyler loves, sports, Detroit sports. This is the Megacast. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on, to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 mask. The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Great to have you with us for the remainder of this week's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We've had a great week here, Uh, Tyler. A lot of work uh, by the team behind the scenes, not only getting the studio up and running, we are back in our new socially distanced studio here, but also to uh, Larry and Jake and the entire team. And also we want to give a shout out uh, to the team at Henry Ford, as well as the uh, Township Supervisor's Office for all the help in getting the COVID-19 vaccine town hall uh, up and running this week. It was a good show. For those that may have missed it, you can check it out on civiccentertv.com. Before we leave you this week, though, we do want to talk about Detroit sports. The Pistons looking promising? Maybe? Yeah, kind of promising. (laughs) And Sarkhan joins us now. He's the uh, beat writer for the Pistons and the Red Wings with Live. Always great to have you with us. Glad to be with you. Uh, you know, I'm not much of a sports person. I, I'm more focused on their uniforms. <laughs> like the colors and the mascot. Uh-huh. And also one of the most important things, you know, when are the fans going to be able to get back into the stadiums? What's that looking like right now, Ansar? Well, uh, all depends on, uh, you know, the state uh, regulations, what the governor or basically uh, the politicians, what they decide, it's all up to them. Uh, my guess is, uh, in Michigan anyway, uh, we're not going to see that this season. Uh, you are seeing it, uh, you know, some states, uh, limited fans. And, and uh, when the wings were in Florida, in Tampa, and Dallas, uh, some areas there, uh, you had limited fans. Uh, but I, 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 my guess is the uh, best case scenario would be at the start of next season. So, Ansar, have you been able to speak with any of the players or the coaches about this issue? Like, when they do travel, do they like having some fans back in the stands? Or is it better for them to say, hey, let's just leave everyone out and continue on and make it consistent across the league? No, they uh, they want to get things back to normal. They, they like uh, having uh, fans, the atmosphere in the building. Uh, you know, at uh, Red Wings games, they, they pipe in uh, and sound. Uh, and we're piping in a cell phone right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to, just to try to uh, recreate some of the atmosphere, but it, it's obviously not the same. Uh, you know, players have commented. It's like, it's, it's especially noticeable, you know, during stoppages of play, they look around and they see uh you know, almost empty building. Now in Red Wings games, they allow, they're allowing about 200 like friends and family scattered throughout the lower bowl. Uh, but uh, be at nothing beyond that, but uh, definitely has that cavernous feel to it. And uh, they just want to uh, get back to as, 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 as soon as possible how things were. Ansar Khan with us. He is a Pistons and Red Wings beat writer with M Live Media Group. Joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and Ansar, let's talk about the Detroit Pistons. Uh, right now, the Red Wings are kind of in the same spot uh, they've, they've been in. Not a whole lot of movement there. But the Detroit Pistons, 
it's looking like there is some hope going into the future. They got a really young team, a lot of prospects. They're starting to rack up those picks as we've talked about previously. And the big change we've seen in recent days is the decision to bench Blake Griffin mutually between the organization and Blake Griffin and his camp and seek either a buyout or a trade. What really was the final straw in that that brought both the Pistons organization and Tom Gore as at the top the owner and Blake Griffin and his agent to a point where they said it's time for us to separate and we're going to do what's best for both sides here in order to make that happen. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's been a struggle for, for Griffin, obviously, uh, you know, with having uh, two knee surgeries last year, uh, right at the start. They, they were hoping that a long off season and, uh, you know, rehab, that he would be able to, to get back uh, to where he was a couple seasons ago when he was uh, when he was an all-star, uh, but it just wasn't happening. You could tell just doesn't have that mobility, that jump, uh, the, you know, the, the quickness, uh, the ability to, to to, to accelerate to the rim uh, like, he, like he's been known for. And uh, that was apparent for really several weeks here at the start of the season. And I think they just came to the conclusion that, you know, they, they were eventually going to try to trade him. Uh, that's what Troy Reavers been, has, has done since he got here, just completely revamped this roster. Uh, they were able to trade Derrick Rose to the Knicks a couple weeks ago. And I think they just came to the conclusion like, you know, we we got to just we might as well move some young guys into the lineup, get a better look at them, uh, while we look to uh, you know they're hoping somehow that they can trade Griffin, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, he's got another year a uh, player option left at about thirty nine million. Uh, you know they'd have to facilitate some deal where they take back a bunch of salary too. Uh, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think more likely we're going to see a buyout. And, uh, you know, they, they figure what's the point of, uh, of keep trotting him out there uh, in his health, in the condition that he's in, when they're just going to, to look to, to part ways. So they came to a mutual agreement that's best for both sides if he just sits out uh, until they can find a, a new team for him. Yeah, it's going to be a tough going, finding a new team for Blake Griffin, a team that will pick up that contract, being well over $30 million a year, a player option of about $39 million for next season that you would think Blake Griffin would, would take, regardless of whether he's on the Detroit Pistons or another team, because he's not going to get that on the open market with his age and his injury issues. And so it's going to be a lot tougher for Detroit to find a trade partner. It's not going to be like you mentioned the Derrick Rose trade a couple weeks ago where they dealt him to the New York Knicks for a second round pick as well as former uh, lottery pick Dennis Smith Jr. Uh, picked up in the trade. I mean, Rose in his time with the Pistons this year was averaging 14 points per game. He was shooting roughly 43% from the field and five assists in 22 minutes off the bench. He's having a good year despite his past injury injury problems in his last two years have been of quality play made that a lot easier plus his contract is expiring with no player option for the Pistons do they have options in negotiating with other teams to maybe eat some of Blake's contract or are we looking at a situation where this could be a, a buyout coming through and some sort of a stretch provision on that last year of his contract yeah I think inevitably that's that's what's going to have to take place here um, and, and, you know, that, that would, uh, be good for Griffin too, because, uh, then he can, uh, talk to teams himself and kind of pick and choose, uh, what might be the best, uh, situation for him, uh, you know, at this stage of his career, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's been a star in this league for, for, for quite a long time, but he's never even reached the, uh, the NBA finals yet. And I'm sure, uh, I think he's, he's 31 now. He's going to be 32 soon. Uh, you know, it's getting near the end that you know he, he wants to play for a championship contender. He wants to to uh, you know at least reach the finals for the first time. And I think uh, uh, you know getting a buyout uh, would give him a little more flexibility to to pick the best situation for him. Uh, you know, and he, he'll go somewhere where obviously he's not going to be the go-to guy. He'll be a support player. Who knows? Maybe, maybe even a six man off the bench. You know, he's he's played like 642 NBA games, 
he's never come off the bench. He's always been a starter. So maybe that, you know, maybe a team can convince him that, you know, it's, it's best for him at this stage of his career and with, with what he's going through health wise to just come off the bench uh, in a support role uh, for a championship caliber team. Yeah, other than his rookie year, Blake Griffin with the lowest stat perform- statistical performance of his career in 2009, his rookie season averaged just under 14 points this year, averaging 12 points in about 31 minutes per game, playing more minutes now than he did in that rookie season. He's a veteran of the league, coming off injury problems, and expect and going to get 30, just under 39 million dollars next year should he pick up that contract on the other side if they're looking not to do a buyout the pistons and trying to make sure that when blake griffin's contract does expire that it expires and they don't have that they don't lose that cap flexibility in trying to deal with him is there any chance that there are any teams out there that are looking to unload some bad contracts but want to bring in a guy like blake for a locker room presence for extra depth that would be willing to give a couple a couple of second round picks or exchange or swap picks with the pistons and maybe have the pistons say well you know what we're not going to get rid of him but we need with this contract unless we take a couple more years of maybe another bad contract or two and try to pull those in not that i know of i know uh I think earlier this season there were the reports uh, that the Pistons had uh, contacted the Wizards about a, a potential uh, deal for for John Wall, uh, who I think has an even more toxic uh, contract, and then he was eventually traded, uh, of course, to Houston. But uh, I, 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 not not that I know of. I I just don't think uh, I, I don't think they would pull that off. I think it, more and more it looks like it's just going to have to come down to a buyout. We're joined by Ansar Khan on the Oakland County Megacast. He is a beat writer for the of, on the uh, Red Wings and the Pistons for M Live Media Group. And Ansar, the good news here for the Pistons, as we've talked a lot about the bad news and about the Blake Griffin contract situation, things are looking up for the Pistons. They're not winning basketball games consistently this season, but they're looking good. The teams that they are beating tend to be some of the contenders in the league. And I think the biggest positive that they're looking at right now is the play of their young guys, particularly their rookies in Sadiq Bey and Isaiah Stewart, who are having, at least in Sadiq Bey's case, having a breakout year in his rookie year. And Isaiah Stewart, uh, a surprise for a lot of people, but I don't think that's the case within the Pistons organization. How satisfied are they with their rookies, and how is that maybe factoring into Troy Weaver's plans with this rebuild? Does that accelerate the process a little bit, their performance in their rookie season? Yeah, no, they're uh, absolutely, they're, they're delighted with those, especially those two guys that you mentioned. Um, and, and Sadiq Bey is, is, is one guy that really benefits from, from uh, Blake Griffin's eventual departure. And right now is sitting, he's getting a, he started, uh, I think, four of the last seven games. He's uh, getting more minutes, and you can see showing what he's capable of, uh, especially with his uh, three-point shooting. Uh, and then Isaiah Stewart, a guy that uh, he's he's pretty much delivered what the Pistons expected of him, just that toughness, the grit, uh, the, you know, in the middle there. He's an undersized center. But he doesn't back down from anybody. He uh, is very aggressive in, in, in getting rebounds. Uh, he gets under opponent's skin, and that's you know one of the things that this this team needs. He's he's kind of a a bit of a throwback to uh, kind of a he, he'd be a guy that would fit in well on the, on the bad boys or the the, the going to work Pistons. He's in that kind of a mold. Um, so yeah, those two guys uh, have been very good. Killian Hayes, you know, he got off to a, uh, a little bit of a rough start. Not, not, not unexpected for a point guard, especially 19-year-old point guard and starting point guard in the NBA. That's a tough thing to ask of a guy. And, and of course, now he's, he's gone for uh, the majority of the season, if not uh, the entire uh, season, with, with the hip injury. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how he progresses over uh, over the next year. Uh, and then, of course, uh, free agent uh, Jeremy Grant. Uh, He's a guy that's uh, really uh, is, is surprised me. Uh, yeah. I knew he had offensive upside. He showed a little bit of it in the playoffs last year with Denver, but I didn't think it would come together this quickly. 
he's really uh, even pretty much since the second game of the season he's just t- taken off and being the go-to guy for the, the pistons on offense and a good defender too but uh uh just the way his game has taken off offensively one of the most improved players in the league uh and it was you know he came into the season saying it was just a matter of opportunity he needed the opportunity he needed to go someplace where he could be the guy uh, in denver he was like the third option there on a good team he's come here and uh he's, he's pretty much shown uh uh that it, it was certainly a good move uh you know some questioned uh troy weaver signing into a three-year a 60 million dollar deal a guy who'd average something like 12 points uh, in his career but uh, it's 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 looking like a, a good move yeah 20 million dollars a year contract for that performance uh, something that the pistons fans can be really happy about this is a guy that is up there and going to be heavily considered for the most improved player award at the season's end if he continues on this tear that he's on he's, he's an all-star candidate potentially he's been in that discussion as well as was Derek Rose during his play with the Pistons and his continued play with the New York Knicks and things are looking up you look at the per 36 minute stats for guys like Isaiah Stewart it's a double double Sadiq Bey has been shooting the lights out from beyond the arc and young guys on good contracts like Jeremy Grant who have been in successful situations it's a good spot for the Pistons to be in in this rebuild while they're still on top of that losing games but being competitive in the process and setting themselves up potentially for a really nice pick in a pretty stacked upper lottery coming up in this upcoming draft yeah no uh, and you know obviously the record isn't uh, isn't good but like you mentioned uh they have been competitive in, in, in most of their games. Uh, earlier in the season, they had a problem. Uh, they uh, There's quite a few games where they actually had the lead in the fourth quarter, and they just couldn't finish it. They, uh, they were blowing uh, uh, chances to win. Uh, but, they, you know, at least they were competitive in a lot of games that they have been in. Uh, you know, uh, the last game, obviously, was, was uh, uh, quite the... Uh, uh the debacle having a 23 25 point lead whatever it was at halftime against the bulls and then blowing that but it just kind of goes to show uh their youth and that uh, they still need to learn how to win and how to close out games well, Ansar, we thank you very much for joining us on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. we got less than 10 seconds left in the program today. We want to thank all of you for tuning in to this week's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Of course, you can always see us online on CivicCenterTV.com as well as Civic Center TV and Lakes FM throughout the afternoon and evening for replays. We will see you back Monday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. This is the Oakland County Megacast.